Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Drew Sweet. I'm a postdoc at Purdue University. Um, I'm continuing the theme of crazy mitochondrial genomes, um, but I'm going to be talking about mitochondrial genome architecture in parasitic lice. Um, now, the animal or metazoan mitochondrial genome is a highly conserved structure. It's usually a single chromosome that's around 16 kb, and there's usually a fairly conserved gene order within this chromosome as well. And indeed, when we see deviations from this architecture, either fragmented genomes or gene rearrangements on a single chromosome, uh, this tends to be associated with things like cell death and aging, um, and in humans, various diseases. So it's, it's generally not a good thing for the organism. That being said, we do see a few cases of fragmented mitochondrial genomes that pop up across the metazoan tree of life. Um, these are cases where there's the full set of genes or close to the full set of genes um, but instead of being on a single chromosome, they're spread across multiple different mitochondrial chromosomes. So we see examples in sponges, some jellyfish, um, and some parasitic worms, and then at least three times within insects, and the thrips, the book lice, and the parasitic lice. The parasitic lice are a particularly interesting case, and it's what I'll be focusing on in today's talk. These insects are ectoparasites of birds and mammals. They suck blood or they chew feathers and skin, depending on the morphology of the louse. And they, they spend their entire life cycle on the host. And there's been particular interest in the mitochondrial genomics of parasitic lice. And today there are 16 different species um, that are known to have these fragmented mitochondrial genomes, between 9 and 20 different fragments, depending on the species. Um, and the example that I provide here to the left, that's from the human louse. Um, and they, they tend to be these smaller circles. And when we see, so we see this high level of fragmentation, I'll refer to that as, as mini circles because we still see that, that circular structure. I should include a caveat here, and that is that every documented case of these fragmented mitochondrial genomes in lice are all from mammal lice. And so there are no um, bird lice that have these full mitochondrial genomes um, separated, that we know of, separated on these, these multiple chromosomes. A recent phylogenetic study that looked at a number of different groups of parasitic lice based on mitochondrial sequences found that all species of lice that have these fragmented genomes um, are in the same clade. Um, so they're in red here, those are the, the mammal lice. Um, so this suggests that this is a single origin of fragmentation. Um, and a, a, another phylogeny that came out around the same time but was based on over 1,100 nuclear genes, and although the topology was a little bit different from the mitochondrial tree, we still get that clade of mammal lice, again, suggesting a single origin of fragmentation. Nevertheless, there is other research that su suggests that bird lice do actually have very mitochondrial genome architecture um, and probably many circle fragments, but again, we're not, we're not sure. So out of this background, there are two questions I'd like to address. The first is how many times have fragmented mitochondrial genomes arisen? in parasitic lice. Basically, do we see them in bird lice as well as in mammal lice? And then jumping off of this question, um, getting at whether there are patterns to this, to, these, um, to this level of genome fragmentation. And is it informative for either understanding evolutionary relationships or for understanding the order of fragmentation in these genomes? So to do this, uh, we wanted to look across a broad diversity of parasitic lice. I mean, there's a lot of existing um, Illumina sequence data um, for a number of different groups of lice based on some previous work, um, and then use of bioinformatic approaches to assemble mitochondrial genomes. We developed some approaches using the, the pigeon louse in the geno genus Colombicola. Um, this is a widespread genus of louse that's found on pigeons and doves throughout the world. Um, the species that we focused on is this one right here, Colombicola passerinae. Um, there's a photo of the louse and its host. Um, there are, as I mentioned, there's a lot of publicly available whole genome data for lice, but especially for this genus, Columbicola. Um, it's, it's a model system in host parasite evolutionary ecology. And in previous attempts to assemble the mitochondrial genome of this genus haven't, haven't gone too well, um, and there's some indications that it might actually be fragmented. And so I think it's a good place to start um, when looking for fragmented genomes in, in bird lice. We used a couple of different approaches to get the mitochondrial genome from this next-gen data. And so we use a, a fragmented portion or a, a subset of Illumina shotgun reads. And then we use the assembler Atrium, um, which is a targeted de novo assembler um, to, to find these contigs. Um, and then use Mitobin, which is 
um, a, a often used program for assembling mitochondrial genomes. Um, we use that program to as extend those, those contigs. We an annotated those extended contigs to identify genes, um, and then we were also able to identify some extended stretches of identical DNA on the, on the ends of these contigs, which might suggest that um, there's some circular um, architecture here. There's one problem with this approach, and that is that we're, we're dependent on available sequences um, to find our mitochondrial, um, our mitochondrial genes. Because ATRAM is a, is a targeted approach, um, if, you have, if you have fragmented genomes, and if you have, especially if you have fragments that are only tRNAs or that have protein coding genes that are particularly divergent, you're going to have a pretty difficult time um, finding those, those particular fragments. So to overcome this, we use the second approach um, that leverage the, the boundary between coding and non-coding regions that are likely present in highly fragmented mitochondrial genomes. We know from the human louse um, that you tend to have these highly conserved non-coding control regions that are pretty similar between the different or among the different chromosomes. And if you were to, to map reads um, to these assembled chromosomes, you might predict that you would have much higher coverage than those non-coding control regions um, compared to that, that coding region. And this is exactly what we see. Um, so this is one of those contigs assembled with the first approach. You can see the, the protein or the, the coding genes um, in the middle there, and then the coverage, which is in blue, the blue um, histogram at the top, we see that spike in coverage, um, especially relative to the coding region um, on that flanking non-coding regions. And if we zoom into that coding non-coding boundary, um, here are some reads, just examples of some reads from that region. Um, the gray are uh, identical to the consensus, and then the colored are, are varied um, compared to the consensus. And so this is consistent with this highly conserved um, control region, but then going off into different um, coding regions and likely different, different fragments. So we can use the reads that map to this, this boundary, uh, and then we can assemble these, um, and then once again extend them to try to get these whole chromosomes. Uh, to verify this method, we use these approaches in the human louse using Illumina data. Um, once again, this, this species is known to have these mitochondrial mini circles, and this has been confirmed um, with PCR and southern blots. Um, and we were able to recover those fragments using our approaches. Um, so it, it gave us some confidence that we were getting what we were looking for um, moving forward. And they're very similar to um, the published, published sequences. So here's what we found when assembling um, the feather louse uh, genus Colombicola. It's, it's fragmented. We recovered 17 mini circle fragments um, in, this, in this species, between 1,100 and 3,200 base pairs long, um, and containing one to three genes per chromosome. So we're looking at a level of fragmentation that's very similar to the, to the human louse. Um, and just right off the bat, this going back to our questions, this suggests that mini circle fragmentation um, happened at least twice within parasitic life. So we're not just looking at a single origin. But again, we want to look across the diversity of, of, of lice. I'm not satisfied with just finding, just finding one other instance. Uh, and so we applied our approaches looking at a number of different species, so 36 different species of lice that represent 35 different genera. Um, and applying these same approaches um, to, to look for these mitochondrial genomes, here's what we found. Um, they're pretty prevalent <laughs> in parasitic lice. We found uh, 23 species that had these fragmented chromosomes and 13 that had a single chromosome. Um, and just for reference for where we've been in the phylogeny before, this green shaded area, um, if it look, comes up green up there in the top, uh, that's the feather lice or the bird lice. And then that blue box in the middle, um, that's the original fragmented clade, okay? And there's only four representatives in this instance and so it's definitely not just in this clade, um, and we and we um, we see a lot more novel um, novel structures coming up. And if we do an ancestral reconstruction here, based on on the architecture and using just a conservative estimate, um, there are at least 12 independent origins of fragmentation happening in parasitic lice. So more than <laughs> more than just just the one. If we look at the number of chromosomes that, that we recover, they're also quite variable, um, and so. The, uh, the bar plot to the, to the right of the tree here, once again, the, the red bars are the single chromosomes, I and mean, then those blue bars represent the fragmented genomes, um, indicating the number of chromosomes that we find. Um, and there are between two and 20 different chromosomes 
And there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, predictable structure based on, on phylogeny. And so one thing that we wanted to do was then zoom in a little bit and look for informative sites or informative patterns within a clade. So maybe over 100 million years, you know, it's not very informative, but if we look within over 20 or 30 million years, maybe there are some patterns that make more sense. So I'm going to zoom in within this particular subset, and we're going to look at those patterns. So here they are. This tree is just extracted from the larger one that I just showed you. Um, the mitochondrial genomes are indicated to the right, and they're linearized to make it easier to visualize. Um, and the hosts, the bird host species, are, are pictured to the right. Overall, what we find is that there are no universally shared patterns um, among these six different genera. There are lots of gene rearrangements, even between um, gene genera that have single chromosomes. Um, and you can have sister taxa that have drastically different architecture. And so if you look up at the top here, um, these are both lice that occur on, on Timus. This, um, this one species, or this one genus here, has a single chromosome, but its sister genus is highly fragmented. That being said, we do see a few patterns that I think are probably informative. Um, and so in, highlighted in the red boxes here, you see separately in three different genera long stretches um, of of um, identical gene order. So it can perhaps give us some insight into um, what the ancestral order was in this particular clade. And I also think it gives us some insight into the direction of fragmentation, or at least understanding how the singles broke up. <laughs> so if we look at the, the boxes in these two taxa down here, um, highlighted in the boxes are, are gene regions, gene order regions that are identical between the two. Um, and so you might be able to understand kind of direction. Okay, but we're still, there's still a lot of variation here. It seems to be fragmenting pretty quickly. And so the last thing I want to do is look within a particular genus. So we're going to go back to Columbicla, um, which is the genus we began with. We used four different species, um, representing the three major clades of the genus, including two cryptic taxa. And here's what we found in our, our patterns. So um, we found fragments in all of them, um, between 15 and 17 mini circles. The ones that are missing are likely there. We just had, a, had, a, had trouble um, finding them. And we still see some differences. So there's eight rearranged chromosomes. Um, even between closely related taxa, we see tRNAs moving around. Um, that being said, we do see some shared patterns. So there are nine chromosomes that have shared gene, uh, gene adjacencies. Um, and there seems to be a mirror of phylogenetic relatedness. So the, the two cryptic taxa tend to be more similar to each other than either is to the more distinctly related species. So to wrap up with our two questions, how many times have fragmented genomes arisen in lice? They seem to have happened a lot. <laughs> um, and there do seem to be some patterns, but only at some scales because of this rapid architectural change. And going forward with this, um, where we see the field going is understanding the mechanism of this fragmentation. So why do we see so many instances of fragmentation just in lice where it's, it's so rare across the metazoan tree? And I think looking at comparisons within these recently diverged lineages is a useful way to go. With that, I'd like to acknowledge folks who helped with computation, providing samples. I will leave it on my conclusion slide, some contact information. I have maybe 30 seconds or something for questions. Um, so thanks very much. Fusions are possible? Yes, they, so um, there's one genus of Laos where it's, it's likely there was a, a fusion. I think it's very unlikely for it to go back to a single complete chromosome, which actually, it, yeah, so it is possible, but probably pretty rare.